Hello and welcome to another presentation. In this presentation I'm going to talk about municipal bylaws and the scam that they really are. This video is a result of being harassed by the City of Belleville, Brett Forrestal, City Chief Building Official, Samantha Short, Bylaw Enforcement Officer, and the uh, employees at the uh, Templeman LLP, Catherine Templeman and more specifically Jennifer Savini. For those of you that are unaware, I've been putting up with harassment from the municipality for 38 years. I've learned a number of things regarding how courts operate, how to file paperwork, and the actual level that the courts will stoop to in order to support one of their own. When you go into court, you expect to get a fair trial. But if you've gone through court once or twice, you realize that that's far from the truth. What I'm going to explain today will show you that this, the municipalities have no authority on private property. Many municipalities are pushing through clean yards bylaws or amending their zoning bylaws or property standard bylaws in order to force people to give up their livelihood or their possessions so that they can conform to whatever the municipality's whims are. In some cases, they seize property. Well, after you watch this video today, you're going to realize that they have no authority to do anything like, like that. The information presented here is only a small fraction of the paperwork that I presented in a Toronto court case where the judge, seen Dumphy, wouldn't listen to anything. He didn't care about the statutes. He didn't care about what transpired. He didn't care to look at photographs. He simply did not care about anything. That case, court case cost me $3,500 or $3,600. At the same time, another court case was being filed in Belleville. And due to a conflict of interest, they brought in a lawyer or judge from Ottawa. Her name was Madeline Bell. In both cases, the city solicitor did not file a proper statement of defense. Specifically in Toronto, she was late and didn't, didn't properly serve it. And in the Belleville court case, she's even on record as stating she doesn't know how to defend the case. I proved perjury on the part of the city solicitor, Jennifer Savini. I proved perjury on the part of uh, Samantha Short. they didn't care. I have no faith in the legal system and when I tried to requ uh, acquire the uh, transcript for the Toronto court case, the judge had sealed the case. I requested a copy be provided to me, in, you know, either verbally, you know, the, the audio side of it, or in, uh, in writ written format. And I was instructed that the judge sealed the case and I couldn't and wasn't entitled to it. I then went to a certified court transcriptionist and asked them to get it for me and they in fact told me I had the wrong court case, the wrong court date and the judge wasn't on the bench. Now what I did is I recorded the screen because it was done over Zoom and I proved the court date, I proved the judge and I proved I was there and I proved it was relevant to my case so I was entitled to it. I was then informed that this, the judge banned it or, or sealed it so I couldn't get it. There's no legal precedent to seal a court case unless it involves a young offender, maybe a, a, you know, a rape case, something like that, or if there's a matter of national security or intellectual property, or somebody in the, in the uh, witness protection program, or if it's a family matter. Given the fact that this was a simple civil case over property standards issues, which were proven to be false, the judge had no legal right to do that. On top of that, the court case was held in private over Zoom. That's another Ill illegal act. And it wasn't conducted under oath. Another illegal act. And they had, a, they had, uh, there was a motion filed by Jennifer Savini to dismiss the case. The problem is they had communications prior and even on that call where we were sitting in the waiting room waiting to, to be connected to the judge which means they had ex parte communications. That's also illegal. So, I'm providing this information to the Attorney General. 
in the hope that he will, he or she will take the appropriate action and reprimand Scene Dumphy, who operates out of the Toronto Court on University Avenue, and reprimand uh, Jennifer Savini. She's a member of the Law Society, and she works for for uh, Templeman LLP, 205 Dundas Street, Belleville, and reprimand Cap Catherine Templeman, because she also works for Templeman LLP, and she was made aware of these actions and the illegal uh, process that was involved in it. Now, given the fact that the Attorney General is supposed to also regulate the laws and regulations and statutes, he or she would also have to reprimand uh, Samantha Short, who's the bylaw enforcement officer, because she was told she was breaking the law. I gave it to her in black and white. And she would, he, the uh, Attorney General would also have to address the uh, chief building official, Brett Forrestal. Because he was made aware of it. In fact, we had a conversation. In fact, it was the one and only conversation that we had. And he started yelling and raving like a raving lunatic. And I told him point blank that he doesn't have the right to operate that way and he should calm down if he expects to get anywhere. I, I told him point blank, if he continues to operate like that, people are going to tell him to get stuffed, and rightfully so. I was always calm within my communications as getting mad and angry doesn't solve anything. You're always better to try and resolve your issues outside of court. And when the court case happened in Belleville, a uh, number of judges, there was a conflict of interest because either I knew them or the city solicitor knew them. And so we ended up with this guy named Rob Scott. And I knew Rob Scott previously. He used to uh, have his own law firm. And he said, I can't handle this case, and I suggest you guys settle it privately. And he wanted an inspection of my property, which I didn't have to agree to, but I did in order to resolve this outside of court. Well, that, that inspection happened virtually within an hour of having that hearing. And he said, if you don't settle it, I'm going to have to bring in a judge from outside party, which they brought in Madeline Bell from Ottawa, from Ottawa. Now, somebody could say, well, you could appeal your court cases. Yes, but in order to appeal a court case, you have to get the transcript. And yes, you could put a motion into court and ask the judge to order that transcript be released. But you have to notify the other side within six months. They may have an objection. And the whole thing drains out more, more of your life. This legal battle with the municipality has been ongoing because they keep alleging false statements and have been doing so after the la for the last 38 years. They allege tall grass and weeds. It's never been proven an issue. They claimed accessory structures. Again, that was proven to be incorrect. Then they claim vehicles that don't have license plates. Well, as you're about to find out, vehicles don't require license plates unless they're on the highway. So, with that said, I'm going to proceed with this, and I'm going to show you a letter from the Ministry of Transportation that says exactly that. There's the letter from the Ministry of Transport, signed by Josh Hanna. And I have blown up the section part of it, so it's easier for you to read. And I will read it to you. Section 7 of the Highway Traffic Act. No person shall drive a motor vehicle on a highway unless the vehicle has currently validated permit displayed on a number plate attached to the vehicle. Additional details of number plate and permit uh, requirements and fees and penalties can be found in Regulation 628 Vehicle Permits under the Highway Traffic Act. Information on how to register a vehicle can be found on Ontario.ca. A vehicle which is permanently parked on private property does not require registration or a valid permit and cannot be used on a highway without registration. Thank you for your question and your interest in vehicle registration process. Assigned, it was signed sincerely, Josh Hanna. That makes it very clear that the municipality had no right to bother me with respect to motor vehicles which they said were derelict because they didn't have plates. It's that simple. Yet the court failed to recognize that letter, which was provided in an affidavit. If we also go under uh, Section 50 of the Municipal Act, you see here under Section 50, municipality does not have the power to pass a bylaw establishing a system of permits for motor vehicles or trailers as those are defined under the Highway Traffic Act, similar to a system under Part 2 
of that act. So they have no right to put in a clean yards bylaw or a property standards bylaw or any other bylaw to regulate the licensing and parking of motor vehicles. And the letter that I provided in the first, uh, one of the first slides there comes from the Ministry of Transportation. So I would ask the viewer, well, what, min what grants the authority of the municipality to have superiority over that of the, of the, uh, the uh, Ontario government? How can a lower form of government have more authority than the Ontario government, which gives it its authority? It simply doesn't make sense. Under Section 63.1, if a municipality passes a bylaw for prohibiting or regulating the placing, stopping, standing, or parking of an object or vehicle on or near a highway, it may provide for the removal and impounding and restricting and immobilizing of any object or vehicle placed, stopped, standing, or parked on or near a highway in contravention of the bylaw. Subsection 170.15 of the Highway Traffic Act applies where necessary modifications to the bylaw. So if your vehicle or your trailer is parked on your private property and is not obstructing the view from anyone, you know, traveling down the road, and in my case, in fact, is behind a solid gate which you can't see through, and there's trees down both sides of my property and a hedge across the front, and the city's on record as saying they can't do a proper inspection from the road, then I asked Remain that they didn't, they didn't get a complaint. And the city can't write its own complaint because that would be a conflict of interest. The city said they got a complaint. They provided the, the alleged complaint and it had the company letterhead on top and verbiage on the bottom about signs or, or garbage collection or something to that nature. So it was very clear that that alleged complaint did not come from anybody. In fact, when it was proven in a court of law, the uh, city lawyer admitted on the record that the city wrote their own complaint based on their inspection. Well, they had no right to trespass on private property. That's R versus Lee, a superior court case from the Supreme Court of Canada, which trumps the Mickey Mouse courthouse we have. And on top of that, it violates the Trespass to Property Act. So they had no justification, no cause to do anything. Now, carrying on with Section 63, uh, 2, says subsection 1 does not authorize any action with respect to a motor vehicle on a parking lot on land not owned or occupied by the municipality. That makes it very clear. Now it says under section 131 of the Municipal Act, without limiting sections 9, 10, and 11, a local municipality may prohibit and regulate the use of any land for the storage of used motor vehicles for the purpose of wrecking or dismantling them or salvaging parts from them for sale or for other uh, uh, disposition. So that means that that's commercial. If you're selling parts off a vehicle, you're operating commercially. But they have no jurisdiction on private property with vehicles that are all intact and nothing's missing. Section 164 of the Municipal Act reads, without limiting sections 9, 10, and 11, a local municipality may prohibit or license trailers located in the municipality. Well, that's nice, because under further down, under 2, it says, if a municipality licensed trailers in the municipality, no license fee shall be charged in respect to a trailer assessed under the Assessment Act. That has nothing to do with me. I'm private. And then it says, restriction trailer camps. If you have a trailer camps, that means it's plural, more than one. And it says, if a municipality licensed trailer camps under business license, so again, that's commercial, bylaws and imposes license fee on each lot in a trailer camp to be occupied by one trailer. No license fee shall be charged in respect of a lot that is to be made available only for a trailer that is assessed under the Assessment Act. The Assessment Act has nothing to do with my private property. Now under 4, definition. Trailer means any vehicle constructed by to be attached and propelled by a motor vehicle and that is capable of being used by persons for living, sleeping, eating, even if the vehicle is jacked up or its running gear is removed. Trailer camp means any land on which, trailer, which a trailer is kept. But again, we've already seen from the letter from the Ministry of Transport, they have no jurisdiction. So their bylaw can't supersede the provincial government. And in, when we read this thing, it relates to businesses, so again, it doesn't apply. 
Now under section 9 it says a municipality has the capacity, rights and powers and privileges of a natural person for the purpose of exercising its authority under this or any other act. Well, there's two classes of persons. There's a natural person, which is a flesh and blood, and then there's the artificial person, which is a corporation. Under contract law, no person, meaning natural person, can compel another person into a contract without their knowledge and consent, and without consideration, and without full disclosure. Well, the municipality can change a bylaw whenever it wants, or at least it thinks it can, but that doesn't give it any legal authority because there is no consideration or meeting of the minds. How can I agree to something when I don't even know what it is that you've changed or done? And you can't negotiate a contract now and say, well, we'll figure out the terms and conditions later. That's illegal. Also, the city doesn't give anything of consideration. In the case of my property, I have the title deed, I have the registration, I have the land patent, and I have an equitable claim. The city has none of those things. Therefore, I have superiority over any municipality. They don't own my property. And in fact, under Section 17 of the Municipal Act, they can't even charge taxes on your property because it's your property. Under the broad authority of the municipality, a single-tier municipality, which is most municipalities, because they had merged a while back, says it has the rights to governance structure of the municipality and local boards. I can't go to a board meeting. Therefore, that has nothing to do with me. Accountability and transparency of the municipality and its operation of its local boards and their operations. Again, had nothing to do with me. Financial management of the municipality and its local boards. Nothing to do with me. Public assets of the municipality acquired for the purpose of exercising its authority under this or any other act. Good. I have no problem with that because my assets are not public. Economic, social, and environmental well-being of the municipality. Respecting climate change. I skip the word including because including is restrictive to only those things that it states. If you go to a restaurant and, say, and it says you're going to get if you order option one, you'll get uh, steak, potatoes, vegetables, and chocolate cake. And you order option one, and they hand you the, your meal, and you say, well, where's the lemon pie? It wasn't included. So you'd have to understand that the word including is only including that things which it states. Nothing more, nothing less. Now it also says here, health and safety and well-being of persons. Given the fact that my property is private, I don't conduct any business. There is no health or safe, health and safety issues. And then it says under seven, service of things the municipality is authorized to provide. Well, they're not authorized to provide anything on this list. Protection of persons and property. Consumer protection. I'm not a consumer. I'm not selling. I'm not operating a business. Animals. I understand that. You would want your people's dogs registered in case they get rabies or they do some damage. And then it says structures, which is limited defenses and science. They have no right to force you to get a building permit or a, demo, or a demolition permit, for that matter. And then it says business licensing. Well, if you apply for a business license or apply for anything from the government, you're giving up a benefit privilege. An application is actually defined as the, to beg. So why would I want to beg for a benefit privilege? when the municipality has no authority to do it in the first place. But under business licensing, you might say, well, that's commercial. Okay, I'll give you that. Still wouldn't apply to me. Now, under broad authority, under Section 11, the lower municipality and an upper municipality may provide services or things that the municipality considers necessary or desirable for public, subject to the set rules in subsection 4. Well, I think uh, if they're going to do something that it considers necessary, the people should have a vote on it. And if the city pushes it through anyway, and the public doesn't want it, why should we pay for it? With respect to bylaws, however, it says governance of structures of the municipality and its local boards. As stated earlier, we don't have anything to do with the local boards. Accountability and transparency of the municipality operation of the local boards and their operations. Same thing applies. 
financial management of the municipality and local boards. We have no fi we have no uh, say as to how the finances are spent at the municipality. It doesn't apply to us. Public assets of the municipality acquired for the purpose of exercising its authority under this or any other act. Well, my assets are private. Economic, social, environmental well-being of the municipality. Notice it doesn't say the uh, people. So they're looking out for the municipality's best interest. And the, bis the municipality's best interest is to fleece as much money out of you as they can get. And then it says respecting climate change. Well, I don't think the city has much to do with climate change. Health and safety and well-being of persons. Again, I'm not commercial. I pose no no safety risk. Uh, services and things the municipality is authorized to provide under Section 1. Protection of persons and property. Consumer protection. They're not, they're, and they're not protecting a person and their property. In fact, they're trying to take people's property, as you will see later on in this presentation. Continuing the same paragraph within that statute, it says the lower municipality and upper municipality may pass bylaws subject to the set rules in subsection 4 respecting matters within the following sphere jurisdiction. Highways, including parking and traffic on highways. Well, it can't really do that because it doesn't own it and it violates section 7 of the Highway Traffic Act. Transportation system other than highways. So it can set up a bus service. It can do waste management, which is collection of garbage. It can deal with certain public utilities, but I'm not, I don't have any public utilities. Culturals, parks, recreation, and heritage, nothing to do with me. Drainage and flood control, except steward, uh, uh, storm sewers. So if I tell the municipality my neighbor's flooding my property, they're supposed to do something about it. Yet I told the municipality about it at least six times and they did nothing about it. Structures. Fences and signs, right? Including, it's restricted to fences and signs. They got no jurisdiction on buildings. And then it says parking, except on highways. Again, that's restricted to property they own. Animals, well, that, yeah, they might license dogs. Economic development services, I provide no services to the city. Nor would I want to. Therefore, they can't regulate that. And business licensing, I'm not operating a business. So again, they have no jurisdiction on private property. One thing that anybody that's watching this should note, that if you own a trailer or a vehicle, or you put up a shed, and the town enacts some sort of new bylaw, or amends an old one, concerning your property with respect to the trailer, or vehicle, or shed, that weren't in effect when you acquired them or put them up, then you're considered legally compliant, but not conforming. In other words, you benefit from the grandfather clause. As an example, the town has a 50-foot setback from the road for every building. However, they straighten the road out, now it's 30 feet. Do you have to move your house? No. If you're driving a car built in 1929, cop pulls you over for no seat belt, you're legal and non-conforming because the vehicle didn't come with one. Therefore, the cop can't really fine you. What's going to show up on the next slide is actually the recording of a uh, council hearing meeting where there was a number of members who objected to the city trying to enforce a zoning bylaw. And they tried this previously in 2012, and I think in that time it was the property standards bylaw or clean yards bylaw. And the mayor of the city, Neil Ellis, was informed that this was actually illegal because at that time they told me to put my stuff in or on a trailer or get rid of it. When I did so, then they tried to pass this bylaw to restrict all trailers in Belleville. Uh, totally unethical. Anyway, uh, so they tried this uh, again in 2012, and now they're trying it again. And you'll see when you listen to the um, council meeting that the council, in the first few minutes of the meeting, thanked the indigenous people for allowing them to operate on unceded land. Well, that's very important. To look at it from a different way, instead of calling it unceded land, it's ungranted land. Because the people of Canada, the government of Canada, the Queen and all that, took the land from the uh, people that were first here. And I don't like to call them Indians or Natives or First Nations or whatever. They were the original people of Canada. And so if it's unceded territory, that's the same as saying they didn't grant the land over to the Queen. 
So, with that admission, and it's done at every um, meeting, I think, across Canada now, the municipality is admitting that they don't own the land. So if they don't own the land, they have no equity in the land, they got no title to the land, because otherwise they own it, they don't have the title deed to the land, otherwise they own it, they don't have the land patent, because otherwise they own it, and they have no equity, then they really have no claim over the land. Plain and simple. But, for simplicity's sake, if you listen to the uh, presentation, you'll see a number of people come forward and step forward objecting to the local municipality, in this case the city of Belleville, from passing bylaws which would prevent them from parking trailers on their property simply because they exceed a certain length limit. Well, I would argue you have no right to do that. You can't regulate what a manufacturer makes something to, what specifications. As, for example, the city bylaw lady told me I had to cut my grass a certain length. And I said, my grass will be cut to whatever length the lawnmower produces. Otherwise, I have to get a custom-made lawnmower. I don't believe the municipality is going to, uh, you know, cover those costs. I'm under no contract with the municipality. So anyway, she dropped that stupidity. And uh, with respect to these, this meeting... I go up to that meeting and I specifically tell the council that they're operating on unceded territory. I told them that at the meeting that they shut down. And I told them again here that you have no right to do this. You're contravening the letter, which is the one I covered earlier. You're contravening the court judgment, which I covered earlier. And you're, you're violating section 50 and 63. And you have no uh, authority under sections 9, 10, and 11 under your broad authority which is exactly what I covered earlier tonight. Despite these objections and despite my information, which I also sent in writing, uh, the city went through and they pushed this bylaw through anyway. Now, a person could go into court and challenge the validity of the bylaw, but the bylaw simply has no force and effect. It contravenes the statute, and therefore the city's committed fraud. The city's committed fraud. Fraud destroys all that it touches. That bylaw... And anything else they do has no force and effect legally. A person can object or a person can ignore any sort of a bylaw or even a court order if it doesn't follow the prescribed procedures as set forth in the statute. If the court or the municipality is not obligated to follow the statute, then we, the people, who elect these officials are under no obligation either. Remember that the government people are supposed to represent the people and work for the people. That's why we have an elected government. But we all know, and it's self-evident, that our elected government doesn't represent us. If you read that Municipal Act, it says to look out to the, for the best interest of the municipality. And the municipality is a corporation. The corporation has no authority over a living man or woman. Now, I'm being a little bit direct here, but I'm also making the point that I'm asking the Attorney General to listen to what I've stated, listen to the first part of that presentation, or preferably listen to the whole thing. Once again, I urge you to reprimand the people involved. I've named them at the start of this presentation, and I would like a written correspondence as to what you intend to do about it. If you do nothing about it, this will become public knowledge. I simply don't care. Thank you. Now, in the following slide, you will hear the presentation. You'll hear them swearing or, or thanking the uh, First Native people or First Nations people, however they word it, and they specifically state they're operating on unceded land. So that means that anybody that has a land patent, such as I do, the property, they have no jurisdiction over it. They have no right to uh, interfere in an agreement or contract which predates them even invading the country, and further, they have no right to stick their beak into something in a contract which they have no knowledge of and had no, uh, they weren't involved in. Plain and simple. Please listen to the uh, presentation, the rest of it, and you'll hear exactly what I'm stating in the, uh, the follow-up to this, which is the actual council meeting where they once again are trying to push this uh, agenda. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone.
I'll call the Planning Advisory Committee meeting to order. And uh, any disclosure or pecuniary interest, general nature thereof. Seeing none, okay, thank you. I've got some opening remarks. The public meeting is being heard by the City Council Planning Advisory Committee and public notice has been given in accordance with the Planning Act. The non-elected members of the Planning Advisory Committee are Mr. John Beltudis, Mr. Tyler Fenton, Mr. Paul Jennings, and Ms. Sarita Van Dyke. Citizen appointees may ask questions and participate in the discussion in order to assist in making recommendations to City Council, but may not make motions or vote in connection with the public meeting. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Planning Committee or City Council before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of City Council or the Ontario Land Tribunal. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Belleville before the related bylaw is passed, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal unless in the opinion of the Tribunal there are reasonable grounds to add the person or public body as a party. Comments received at this public meeting as well as written comments will be considered by the Engineering and Development Services Department in analysis of the applications that were part of the public meeting tonight. For further information on how to provide comments to the City regarding an application from this public meeting, please email planning at belleville.ca. A recommendation report will be brought forward upon receipt of all agency and public comments in the future. Any person wishing to be advised of the Belleville Planning Advisory Committee's recommendations with respect to today's applications are requested to leave their name and address on the appropriate notification sheet located on the clipboard beside the podium. And with that, we'll move into the public meeting portion. A notice of introductory public meeting draft City of Belleville zoning bylaw consolidation in accordance with Section 34 of the Planning Act, RSO 1990, as amended. If staff could present the application, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the City's new official plan was adopted by Council on November 8, 2021, uh, and it was approved by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing of in April of this year. Uh, following the adoption of the official plan, the city is required to update its zoning bylaws. The zoning bylaw is a legal instrument that puts the official plan into effect and provides for its day-to-day -day administration. Uh, it contains specific requirements that are legally enforceable and construction or new development that does not comply with the new zoning bylaw is not allowed. A draft consolidated zoning bylaw has been prepared for the City of Belleville by Dillon Consulting and on March 20th, 2023, a draft version of the uh, zoning bylaw was posted on the city's website for public review and feedback. Since the release of the draft, staff have received over 60 written comments from the public, city staff, external agencies such as Queenie Conservation and Trans Canada Pipelines. The consolidated zoning bylaw is intended to replace the city's three existing zoning bylaws and includes major updates to modernize and align the zoning bylaw with the city's new official plan. Zoning Bylaw 10245 was adopted by the City of Belleville in 1977. This bylaw generally pertains to Belleville's urban area. This bylaw has been amended over 640 times since it was adopted. Zoning Bylaw 2076-80 was adopted by the former Township of Sydney in 1980. Following amalgamation of the Township of Sydney by the City of Quinney West, the City of Belleville annexed portions of the City of Quinney West, which were formerly the Township. This zoning bylaw has continued to be in effect over these lands of the former township. This bylaw has been amended over 45 times since it was assumed by the city in 2000. Thirdly, zoning bylaw 3014 was adopted by the former township of Thurlow in 1987. Following the amalgamation of the township of Thurlow by the city of Belleville in 1998, this zoning bylaw has continued to be in effect over the lands. This bylaw has been amended over 530 times since it was adopted. The consolidated zoning bylaw is designed as a user-friendly document which contains plain language and modernizes terminology to reflect today's society. The consolidated zoning bylaw will implement the newly approved official plan by allowing more opportunities for additional housing, active transportation, and new types of businesses. The consolidated zoning bylaw also offers new protections for the environment, mature neighborhoods, and sensitive land uses. Staff encourage the committee and members of the public to continue to provide feedback on the draft Staff will bring a recommendation back to the committee once all comments have been addressed. Thank you. Okay, uh, do we have any presentations with this one? Okay. If 
I can just get you to activate the microphone there. There we go. I have such a low voice. Uh, good evening to the chair, members of uh, Planning Advisory Committee, uh, members of staff and uh, citizens that are present this evening. My name is Rory Baksh. I'm a registered professional planner at Dillon Consulting. And uh, with me this evening is Megan Reddy, uh, one of our planners that's been uh, working diligently on the consolidated zoning bylaw. Um, before Megan uh, starts her presentation this evening, I would just like to uh, acknowledge what's been accomplished thus far on this exercise. Um, and I'm going to rewind you back to Kingston, not Belleville, but in Kingston, 2001, they did a strategic plan about how to get their house in order after amalgamation. Um, one of the things that was on their priority list was a new zoning bylaw. Kingston started a new zoning bylaw exercise in 2016 and finished it in 2022. The City of Belleville has started a zoning bylaw exercise last year, and the end is in sight, and that is quite a significant accomplishment that this municipality is able to put its mind to getting something done and working towards seeing it achieved. And that is really something that we, we as a team serving the city are very proud to be part of. Um, uh, and uh, before I hand it over to Megan, the other thing that I think is uh, worth mentioning is while the end is in sight, uh, our minds and our uh, ears are still open and still listen, ready to listen. So we know that there's uh, members of the public who want to provide feedback. We're happy to hear that feedback. We're happy to work with everyone to try to make this a really good zoning bylaw by the time it comes forward for uh, Council's ultimate adoption. With that, Megan, can I turn it over to you? Thank you. So since project kickoff, a number of technical briefs, discussion papers, and topic-specific reports and reviews have been completed. A comprehensive list of these reports can be found in the staff report. In addition, a total of four public information centers were held throughout this process including two held earlier this year, uh, one in April and one in May. Public comments have been accepted and tracked throughout the process and have all been considered for inclusion in the new comprehensive zoning bylaw. Currently, the work to date has brought us to the third and final phase of the zoning bylaw review. So a draft comprehensive zoning bylaw and mapping have been prepared and is now in the statutory process. This meeting is an important part of the statutory process and we will have time for comments at the end of this presentation. For context, zoning bylaws are regulatory documents that implement the policies of an official plan. As the name implies, they are law. The zoning bylaws implement land use, locations of buildings and structures, the type and use of those buildings and structures, and lot size, parking, heights, and setbacks, all in support of official plan goals and policies. This project has intended to do three things, to implement official plan policies, as previously described, consolidate the three existing zoning bylaws, providing harmonized provisions and definitions across the city, and to modernize the zoning bylaw so that it is easy to use and interpret. This is not just limited to the style of the document itself, but in the structure of the writing and in the use of simplified language. Consolidating the three existing zoning bylaws, which are all over 30 plus years old, has meant reducing the total number of zones applied across the city. We've consolidated 31 residential zones into five, 21 commercial zones into six, and 16 industrial zones into five. The new consolidated zoning bylaw has a modern structure using tables to reduce text heavy provisions and provide easy comparison between uses within a zone. The tables have been designed to be AODA compliant and able to be used by a screen reader, providing greater access to the zoning bylaws that was not previously allowed through the other three. Additionally, definitions have been synthesized and now apply across the entire city. This reduces confusion in interpretation and ensures, ensures the same definitions apply to all, providing equity instead of the previous three sets of definitions. Zoning standards across the zones have been updated to support current styles of development and aid planning staff in the review and approval of applications. Additionally, these new standards will reduce the need for minor variances. And a mature areas overlay provides additional control to staff in areas with traditional building styles. I'm now going to hand it off to Rory to discuss some specific matters that have been brought to our attention through the process. Um, it's not surprising uh, for this exercise that uh, we've come across some you know, modern issues, things to be looked at, housekeeping matters. Uh, in the various zoning bylaws that I've worked on, this is part of the course of doing a zoning bylaw. 
because communities are dynamic and ever-changing, and the regulatory tools that we use to implement planning need to move along with those changes and those trends. Um, and so some of the things that so we've put our mind to are matters such as uh, you see on the screen, accessible parking, uh, backyard hens, shipping containers, uh, railway provisions. These have all kind of emerged as we've been doing the work. And I'd like to share with you a few of these perspectives um, as it relates to bringing uh, a new unified zoning bylaw that is also modern uh, to bring that forward for the city of Belleville. So um, it is really important that we make provision for accessible parking. Uh, one, it's the law. Uh, there are provincial requirements to provide accessible parking, um, but also it's also uh, it's good planning. Like we need to um, ensure that as mobility uh, needs change, as uh, communities change, that we are able to meet those needs appropriately. Um, we are currently uh, in a process of making sure that these accessibility requirements are uh, well calibrated and properly uh, refined and suitable. Um, we have uh, a draft in the version that is currently uh, before the committee and the public, and we will continue to work on um, getting those right-sized as we finalize them. But I think we're off to a good start there. Um, working in parallel with us in uh, the zoning bylaw exercise was uh, engagement on some other matters uh, that were of interest to the community and to the city, uh, matters such as uh, shipping containers. You may have heard a lot of buzz about all these kind of you know different uses for shipping containers and what we should be doing with them in, in, in any municipal jurisdiction. Um, a uh, question about parking of recreational vehicles and similar type vehicles has come up and um, backyard hens. So uh, the work that Planning Solutions did brought forward some perspectives which have now been incorporated into the draft with an understanding that this is still a draft. And again, as you've heard me say, we're still open to receiving feedback and continuing to work uh, with the city and citizens to refine it. Um, so there's, uh, in this draft zoning bylaw, means to allow shipping containers. So. For example, out in the rural area, if you need a shipping container, you want to use it for a storage purpose. That's quite similar, for example, to having a shed. Absolutely no problem. Um, as it relates to backyard hens, uh, there are requirements for that. So if somebody that lives uh, in this, the urban part of the city and wants to have backyard hens, we provide an allowance for that with appropriate restrictions that are modeled after what other communities are doing that make that still suitable in an urban context so that it doesn't suddenly turn into agriculture it's the type of thing that would be appropriate, you know, an opportunity, for example, to, to gather eggs, um, uh, but not really much else, uh, because at that point, then it becomes agriculture. Um, we did uh, learn from planning solutions, and again, it's my experience that municipalities do have, uh, within the extent of their parking requirements, um, regulations for parking of recreational vehicles, boat trailers, those types of things. Um, it is quite common across Ontario. Um, and uh, there's a variety of different approaches that are being used. Uh, in our case, uh, and what's been recommended is uh, a length uh, of the vehicle um, and as well making sure that the rules in regards to what's allowed to be parked are made clear in this version of the draft. Um, one thing that is a little bit different is uh, some municipalities have in their zoning bylaw a strict rule in regards to what is considered the seasonal parking. And so in a period of time, uh, they're a little bit more relaxed and then during another period of the year they're very strict. In this case uh, there is nothing seasonal, it's just generally the allowance is granted. Um, we understand that uh, we may want to hear from some other perspectives in that regard and we're, again we're open to hearing from those other perspectives. Uh, we will um, receive all uh, comment from this point going forward. We have actually received a number of comments through staff. Staff have been uh, excellent partners on this exercise in um, receiving comments and then funneling technical experts and, and providing support on this exercise. We will consider all further comments that um, come through, uh, make revisions as appropriate to, again, produce a modern, up-to-date, current zoning bylaw that is useful for the City of Belleville going forward, uh, and that will be accompanied with a recommendation report, ultimately, um, for, uh, for this municipality's approval. And uh, with that, we very much uh, thank you and welcome any questions that you may have as it relates to the draft zoning bylaw or, or any other subject matter. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you for your presentation and all your work. Uh, any questions from committee members? No, I don't see any. So I'm going to open up for. Uh, 
for public comments. Anyone wanting to speak uh, on the zoning draft zoning bylaw can come forward, state your name, and uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. My name is Ron Marsh. I've lived here most of my life and then going through a lot of traumas myself and a lot of other people in this room are as well. Because when I speak, I speak that all of us are carrying burdens, every one of us. So I'm not speaking for myself. I was trying to get across at the last meeting a very serious thing that took place where the mayor left the room. And I was kind of boisterous. And I apologize for that. That's my fault. I don't do things like that. But I had no choice. I look at it myself as running away. He knows me. He knows who I am. And I know who he is. But that's not the point. The point is we have to come up with some kind of a settlement where we all can benefit, not just one side. And I'm asking here, and so I won't take up too much time from you people, is patented land is very serious, extremely serious. As a matter of fact, patented land goes back when I was here last week on the 28th. You stand up and you have to thank the Algonquins for being on their land. That's patented land, unseated before the Queen arrived to Canada. I'm standing here and I'll do everything I can to see to that the patented land is kept in contact. Because where I moved and where a partner of mine that I have right now moved, we've been fighting for 38 plus years to put this end to beating up on people who have patented land before the Queen arrived. It has to stop. We know that. Gating can take place on these things. You don't have to put the people out of their homes. There's ways of doing it to be easy on people without damaging their home and damaging their lives and people that are involved in it. We've got to find a way to stop damaging people because the king wants it this way. This book here that I have, there's only three of them in Ontario. It's in the Senate. These are laws, not acts. So I'm known as a paper terrorist and I'm glad I am because I'm trying to help my daughter and other people, not myself. I'm not greedy. And that's what runs everything. Greed runs everything. These people are on the street. Half of them are completely innocent. I worked in a prison for five years. Mr. Marsh. I, and so Mr. therefore, Marsh. all I'm going to do is not say anymore. If you don't want me to talk anymore, I'll stop. No, I, I, I'm just going to try to keep you on topic. So this is about the zoning bylaw. Yes, okay. And so if you keep your comments limited to the zoning bylaw, you may proceed. Okay, so the zoning, the, zoning by, the zoning bylaw, all I know is that this other gentleman that I'm with right now knows that uh, there's a development taking place on, um, what's the name of that road? Anyways, out in Foxborough, River River. Mudcat Lane. It was a road that I used to be on one time when I had a ba uh, my, my wife and whatnot. <laughs> but anyways, Mudcat Lane. And apparently there's a development taking place uh, and, and along the Moira River there and a development going in for maybe a casino and other things, a park, whatever is being done. I just talked to the people today who are putting it in and it's, it's not a story, it's true. So we need to gate something here and be honest with people and stop passing bylaws without letting people know what's going on. Be more honest about it. And I won't, won't have any problems with me or the fellow that uh, we're working together with. We won't have any problems at all. I'm the, probably the easiest going guy there is in Belleville. Okay. Thank you very, very you. much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank okay? you. Yes. Any, anyone else wishing to speak? Yes, my name is Stan McDonald. And some of you were here at the last meeting and you'll remember and you can reference what Ron said. To keep on topic, what Ron alluded to was pat land patent. When land is patented, it's non-taxable. It's also non-taxable under Section 17.1 of the Municipal Act. So again, I'm going to 
Hang on. Narrow, nope. I'm going to narrow your comments to the zoning bylaw. You're talking about taxation, which has nothing to do with the zoning. Well, it does because it connects to the land patent. That's why you don't interrupt me. It connects to the land patent. So if you're going to do something under zoning and the land is patented, you need the, the permission to do any local improvement under Regulation 322-12 to do any modifications on property. If you don't have that consent, you can, you're opening yourself up to a lawsuit. So it does deal with zoning, and it does deal with private property, and it does deal with a land patent. When land is patented under uh, prior to Confederation, it's transferred or conveyed, which means if you're going to do something with the zoning bylaw or whatever, or even a planning board or anything like that, you have to have public input or public knowledge. It actually falls under the, the uh, Municipal Act, Regulation 238, 238, 239. You can look it up. And they don't have public meetings. The last meeting we were at, we were shut down. Just, just to be clear, and I don't want to be argumentative, but if you've listened to the presentation from Dylan Consultant, yep. there's been four public information meetings. This uh, draft bylaw has been advertised and published publicly. And this is a statutory meeting of the Planning Advisory Committee under Section 34 of the Planning Act. So to be clear, this is a lawful meeting that we're conducting here, and there was a process where there continues to be consultation. So I want to I want to I want to correct you on the suggestion or uh, the premise that there has not been public consultation. What we're doing here tonight is part of that process, but that consultation has occurred for some time. In, it, in this case, yes, but in the other case, in the other bylaws, all the bylaws that are passed by the municipality so far that I've looked up, which is quite a number, a lot of them don't have, didn't never had public input. It wasn't even put in the newspaper. And when you do something, did you inform the people of Belleville, the people of Thurlow Township, that they have a right to protect their property? You can't just push the zoning bylaw through because you're dealing with patented land. This is what I'm getting at. Did you inform the public that they have a right? under patented land, their land is protected. Did you do that? Yes or no, yes or no answer? We're, this, this is not an exchange. My comments to you are to keep you within the goalposts of today's meeting. Right. If you want to speak to the zoning bylaw, the podium is yours. This will not be an exchange where I'll be answering questions. Well, it's something to think about. If you didn't inform the public that their, their, their land is patented and they have a right to object to it, then you didn't do full disclosure, which means your zoning bylaws without full disclosure, technically it could be subject to legal prosecution. The same with any other bylaw. Right? You're passing bylaws. Bylaws are a set of rules that govern a corporation. They're a corporate policy. I don't think anybody's going to argue with that. But if you don't disclose to the people that their land is under patented land, and you technically can't do this unless they don't object. Well, for those people that do object, you have to stop and refrain from doing anything because it's patented land. And that deals with your zoning. It also deals with property standards or anything else. It deals with everything. Because the municipality is supposed to be the representative of the people. And if they don't represent the people or if they don't follow the prescribed rules and regulations and recognize patented land, then they're operating what's called ultra-virus, which makes their, every action they do illegal. And fraud doesn't have an expiration date. So somebody that's lived for the property for 40, 50, 60 years, once they find this out, you're opening yourself up to a can of worms. So I'm suggesting that you tell the people that they're operating on patented land before you do anything as far as changing the parameters. And in regards to the motor vehicles that the guy mentioned, under Section 50 and Section 63 of the Municipal Act, you can't regulate the licensing or parking of motor vehicles. That's consistent with Section 7 of the Highway Traffic Act. That's also consistent with a letter from the Ministry of Transport. So you do not have the authority to regulate vehicles. You don't have the authority to regulate anything, in reality, because under the circumstances, the broad authority of the municipality regulates Section 9, 10, and 11. 9 deals with a natural person. One natural person can't compel another person to, into a contract or an obligation without their consent. 10 and 11 are both the same. They and deal I, with economic I, development I need you and to, certain businesses. Mr. M Mr. McDonald, I need you to speak to the zoning bylaw and the zoning bylaw only. If you have nothing further to say, I'll thank you for your comments. What are you going to do in regards to sections 9, 10, and 11 and section 50 and 63 as I just brought up? 
because that's directly related to your zoning bylaw. It was on the screen. Again, this is not an exchange. Your comments are noted. Staff are making notes. We have the consultants present. There will be no, this is not an exchange. Do you have anything further? No. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Anybody else would like to come forward? If you could state your name, please. Good evening. My name is Kathy Pollan. I'm a resident of Belleville for over 50 years. I'm not going to say exactly how long because I don't want you to know my actual age, but that's what it is. I'm here to discuss the um, RV trailer 13.22 section 4. And as this gentleman said here, dynamic is ever changing. When COVID-19 came, my husband and I went out and purchased a 27 foot trailer with the tongue, it's 30 feet. Uh, it is 11 feet tall from the top, from the tires to the top of the air conditioner. We have a beautiful house in the city of Belleville. We have designated a gravel so, uh, the side of our yard, a gravel off the end of our driveway, beside our garage, a gravel patch it has been professionally done where we bring our trailer after we've had a camping trip. We just returned today from Algonquin Park at Rock Lake. We had a tire blowout it's on the way home, and thank God it happened in Bancroft. But if we were not allowed to bring our trailer back to our, our residence, we would not be able to take care of the damage ourselves. We would have to take it to a professional in order to have the tools readily available and to have the equipment that we need to fix it. I don't know if any of you own a trailer, but for us, we go out and we have the trailer at the side of our property. We actually put a 200 amp, got it with permits, a 200 amp service put in with a 30 amp on the back of our house so we can plug our trailer in. We allow it to cool before we get going so that our refrigerator keeps our food cold from designation A to designation B. When we come home, we again plug it in so we can clean our refrigerator, get our food out, get it restocked, get our laundry out, and give our trailer a deep clean. Again, if we were doing this off in a different storage area, that would be a little difficult. I know um, in the um, comments that this gentleman made, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, um, he says there's no seasonal RV. I would suggest that. I would like to see the bylaw amended so that we would be allowed to park our RVs beside our house from you know April 1st to Thanksgiving during that period. I think it's a good compromise. I think our trailer looks a lot better than um, some properties that have two steel trailers on their property. I keep my property well, most of my community does, and I expect by law to go and knock on my door if I'm not cutting my grass and if my trailer becomes derelict. I expect that knock on my door. I would appreciate that knock on that door. Maybe my neighbor needs help. There could be many things, but I would actually encourage that to happen. So I just want to say that I thank everybody for their time and their efforts. I know this is not an easy job, and you're not going to please everybody. I've been on that end of the stick um, with the business that I'm currently in, but I hope you'll consider my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> is there anyone else wishing to speak? Yep. If you come forward. And... Have a note here. Okay, that's not coming up. My name is uh, Jessica Crossan. I'm also a resident here of Belleville of almost 30 years. And um, my sister and I actually purchased properties very close to my parents in the east end of Belleville. There was a method to this. We sacrificed the amount that we were paying for our properties to not only be able to be close to each other, but to also be able to have driveways that were very close to each other. That's because my parents, who are present here today, um, who are now retired, that has become their passion in retirement is camping. Um, my father is a veteran and he is also connected with additional veterans in this camping community, uh, the Kente campers as they're called, uh, where they do travel all across Ontario camping together. Without the ability for my parents to park their RV or trailer uh, in their driveway uh, throughout the summertime, um, it, it would be impossible for my parents to continue what their passion is uh, into retirement. Um, I personally feel that this amendment um, is not necessary and it is redundant of the existing bylaws that can be incorporated into the new bylaw or the new zoning plan. 
um, the existing bylaws with respect to property standards, parking, as well as per property use, um, already more than address the amendment um, amendments that are being proposed specifically with respect to RVs and uh, our trailers parked on properties. That's all I'm speaking about today. Um, the length. Uh, to be specified, putting a cap on the length, I think is unnecessarily, in my opinion. That's specifically what I'm speaking to. Um, it is when you have the calculations for boat storage that contradicts the allowance for RV storage, it doesn't make sense. If I have a 16 foot boat, that is the length from bow to stern. It does the current amendments to the bylaw does not take into account the um, prop, the rudder, or the trailer addition, additional to the actual boat itself. So if I have a 16 foot boat, I would have an additional potentially six feet for that front V trailer coming off the front of the boat that hitches on because hitches are also not included in the calculation from my understanding. Um, as well, the prop and the rudder are not in that calculation. So you could have a 16 foot boat that actually takes up 22 feet in a driveway. But a 22 foot trailer is not prohibited according to these bylaws. The contradiction does not make sense. Um, also with the, the rising costs, um, RVing and camping is something that families partake in and families, especially extended families like ours where you have three families camping all together at once. Um, that's something that we enjoy to do and it's cost effective. We cannot enjoy the local amenities that we have in this area. We can't go to Sandbanks because you have to get a reservation weeks in advance and when you go, you cannot enjoy Sandbanks like you used to when we were growing up. It's not fun anymore. You have to go elsewhere. Um, and therefore, uh, it's difficult for families to now have to put the additional cost of storage during that they would normally be able to park their trailers in their driveways in between camping seasons or camping trips, uh, that additional cost on them. Um, further, the lack of storage in the city is atrocious, let alone safe, safe storage. Uh, we have parked at every single storage facility in Belleville, been broken into in every storage facility in Belleville, and had items stolen from our trailer in every single storage facility in Belleville. Uh, we have had to go outside of Belleville and are now seeing that same problem in the Sterling area. So at home in our driveway where we have three homes that have security footage and security cameras and three people who can jump out and see if there's anything happening can protect our assets. We have care and control of our motor vehicle when it's in our driveway. We can't say that when it's on some other storage lot that is now continuously broken into. Um, further, just with respect to the comments that uh, the gentleman from Dillon Consulting made, I think comparing Kingston's rate at um, amending and passing their zoning um, it just shows that this amendment and particularly this needs more time to consider the growing families and the growing uses of properties that is happening here in Belleville. Belleville is not Thurlow anymore as mentioned, we amalgamated and it, it is a different city. We have a huge influx of new families coming in. RVs are not meant to be stored and used in your driveway for residential purposes. You're not supposed to be living in them, and the current bylaws already address that. The length is irrelevant, whether it's a 12-foot small trailer that's being, as the previous woman pointed out, not properly maintained versus a 25-foot trailer that is being beautifully maintained, pride of ownership in it, nobody is residing in it. You're maintaining the property around it, so you're just increasing to your property value as well. Um, and as well, the amendment also doesn't address the time frames. Um, my, we do go on constant and frequent RV trips. So my, my one question is, are we not able to park our RV in our driveway in between trips? As the woman pointed out earlier, she had an incident on the road. Thankfully, that doesn't happen to most of us, but we do still need to come home, clean out our fridges, clean all the bedding, vacuum the entire trailer after a weekend with dogs in a trailer and you know getting dirty. You need time to clean before your next trip. Are you not able to do that in the driveway as you have currently been able to do? And if so, where are you able to do that? Are we now going to incur additional costs of having to purchase an extra vacuum to keep in our RV, to keep at the storage facility? How are we going to get power at the storage facility to power the vacuums? So those are my comments. And thank you very much for listening. Again, I know you have a very hard job and taking a lot of comments on this. So I appreciate you listening to all of our feedback. Thank you.
just just before the next uh, public comment, I just I just want to be clear and, and and just let the public gallery know uh, that there'll be some resolutions that we're going to pass tonight. That's just process oriented. There is no final decision. Uh, this committee and this public meeting tonight is to hear this feedback and then staff to take the feedback, analyze it with the consultants, come back to this committee before this committee makes a recommendation to council, which has the final decision. So this is still very much a uh, fair game and open process here. Uh, so just to be clear, there's, there's no final decisions being made today. If you want to state your name yeah. and your presentation, that would be great. Kathy Hunt, I am from Belleville. That's my daughter, and she did a really good job. Good job, Jessica. <laughs> she started to touch on what I just wanted to talk about. She didn't look at her phone, so I won't look at mine. Um, um, I have had personal experience last winter. We've always parked our, for personal pre reasons, we park our trailer in a storage lot in the winter. We don't want it in the driveway. It's in the driveway during the summer. Last winter, we had an issue. We've always parked at what used to be the Carl Cox um, RV storage on Herkimer, um, just by Station Street. And it's changed owners several times over the last few years. And uh, the last owners, the current owners, I guess, um, last winter when we took our trailer in, we noticed the security fence was all down. And there's a homeless encampment in behind the storage facility. And I called and uh, asked about putting the fence back up. And I had already seen on Facebook that the cameras didn't work, the security cameras. So it was like, are you putting the fence back up here? Um, no, they weren't planning on it. And uh, I was told politely if I didn't like the lack of security, take my trailer elsewhere. So I went home. We left it, but it was only there for a day. I went home, called around to all the storage facilities in town. and. There was one lot in Belleville that could accommodate me last winter at triple the cost of what we were accustomed to on Herkimer. Uh, they wanted $120 a month versus $40. Um, so we ended up going to Sterling with our trailer. We took it there. I got the last spot. Our trailer is only 29 feet. It's not large. Um, I got the last spot in a lot in Sterling. But I'm just saying that to ask all the residents of Belleville to now try and find storage, it's impossible. We do not have storage facilities in the area to accommodate all the trailers. I don't know what I'll do if you say, you know, this is the bylaw and you have to, I don't know where I'd take it because last winter when I just wanted it for the winter, I had to take it to Sterling. There was nothing available to park it at here. So that's just my comment that there is a lack of storage facilities and secure um, storage facilities around that I don't That's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. McDonald, I'm going to let other people speak. I got one comment. Anybody that's got a trailer under the planning, there's a thing called legal and non-conforming. Mr. McDonald, I'm going to I'm going to have you take a seat. If you have other uh, comments that you'd like to provide, you can email the city, planning at babble.ca, but in fairness to other people who want to speak, I need to, to move the process along. I appreciate that, but this Thank will you. save everybody a bunch of time. Thank if you. If you have a trailer and Thank you, you pass an order, you're legal and non-conforming. It's not an issue. Mr. McDonald, please. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is David Burnham uh, to the mayor and I guess this council and planning committee, correct? I'm a new resident of Belleville. I've been here two years. Um, one of the reasons I, I guess I moved to Belleville is I'm retired and I wanted to use the uh, wonderful Bay of Quinney over here as a recreational opportunity. So like the person I am who's obsessive, I went and bought two boats. <clears throat> Right, because I like power boats because they go fast, but I also like sailboats because I enjoy the ride. Now, I guess what I was hoping I'd see some of the other fellow members from my yacht club here in Belleville, which I joined last year. I took the adult learn to sail program. Uh, I love sailing. I'm 71 years old. I thought I was crazy <laughs> doing it, but I'm doing it. And I guess I'm speaking on behalf of members rather than myself because. I actually went out this year and upgraded my sailboat from 23 feet to a whopping 30 feet 
which means I can't put it on a trailer. A lot of my colleagues, though, have boats that are called trailer boats, meaning they range in size from 17 to about 25 feet. And a lot of people to date have been basically storing those boats on their own property because they can load their boat onto the trailer and then trailer to their, their property. And those are about 25 feet in length. Now, a 30-foot boat, I'm not talking about that because I take my 30-foot boat and this could be on the hard down on, on Victoria Point. Okay, so that's not the issue for me. It's, it's just basically I'm speaking now to more of my colleagues who have the shorter boats and who, again, are retired people like myself. And I don't know about you, but inflation is killing me. The cost of basically storing boats uh, among the marinas here uh, has escalated tremendously. I've been here basically boating for five years, although I moved here for two years ago full time. But I'm finding the cost almost prohibitive in terms of storage costs at a marina that's secure. And like the RV people have been talking about, I've investigated most of the facilities on, I believe it's Herkimer. And um, I'm not satisfied that they can protect my asset either. <laughs> so I'm a little bit concerned about that. The powerboat size, I have a 17 foot powerboat and apparently uh, it also ha it would meet the requirements under the existing bylaw or the proposed bylaw. Um, but if I was to move up to a 19 or a 20 foot boat, which is really more appropriate, a 17 foot runabout, I'll be honest with you, that's a very small boat in terms of the Bay of Quinney, it's a safety issue. So I'm actually looking at disposing of it and trying to buy something a little bit bigger uh, to suit my needs for fishing and other activities as well, right? So I guess the point I'm again trying to drive to is that I'm coming back to almost what the lady was talking about in the length issue. My feeling is that if something is trailerable with a reasonable height and a reasonable length, and having been trained as an urban planner some 45 years ago, <laughs> so. I, I kind of think that the test of reasonableness for me would be that if, if the height and the length can be accommodated within the length of the, of the driveway that you're looking at, and I happen to live just off of um, College Street on Hartwood Drive and around in that area, so our laneways are quite long. We probably uh, have significant length to accommodate a 24, 25 foot sailboat with the hitch. So clearly it's concerned about the hitch. So the hitch would be beyond the 25 feet. So I'm probably up to 30 feet. Um, again, with the power boat, the same thing. So I went to about a 19 or 25, somewhere between 19 and 25 feet in terms of a power boat. And this is a runabout style boat. So we're not talking decks and going into the sky, like you'll see on most of the cabin cruisers. These are basically uh, runabouts. Um, and uh, what people are using them for, again, is for fishing or for I, have, I still have two adult kids and I like to water ski and they like to, uh, they like to tube on the bay. Um, so, I mean, I still like to offer them that opportunity and their kids in the future as well. So, so I guess I'm just coming back to the idea that I think the whole length issue, it's, it's, getting, it's, it's difficult to decide like what's an appropriate length and I know that. But I think there has to be some flexibility in determining what would be an appropriate length and how you would evaluate that. And unfortunately, I know zoning bylaws are regulations, and regulations get interpreted by bylaw officers, and they stick to them. <laughs> so they're out with their tapes, and they measure the length of everything. Because when I had my pool put in last year, I managed to save a little bit of money and had a little pool put in, and I went through the building pr process. But again, I know that, and I'm prepared to do that. But what I'm concerned about are, for example, as I say, a lot of my club members who have the smaller sailboats, um, which brings a lot of revenue actually to the city. They have all the shark races here in Belleville. And I'm actually on the Jubilee Committee for the 150th anniversary of the club. I got myself engaged in the community that way. And so I'm kind of excited about that. And they've, on a regular basis, we hold these uh, sailboat races for the smaller boats, the 21s to 24 foot boats. And people trailer them here, right? They trail them to the club, they trail them to Victoria Harbor. We put them in, they race for three days. Uh, the folks stay in, in town. They rent hotels, um, they stay with their families, you know, and we've got our, our 150th anniversary coming, and I know we're gonna be packing people in for a lot of the events we're talking about. So I guess I'm just trying to make a pitch right now for my other, other, other club members who are not here, and I was surprised that two of them were supposed to be here, but I know one person, he's, he's, uh, he had to go back to work to support his family, like some of us have to do <laughs> because of inflation, so I thought I'd speak on his behalf as well as my own. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um.
I just want to remind uh, members of the public as well is there is a clipboard on the podium. Please add your name and your address if you'd like to be notified or uh, recognized as being registered for tonight. So just reminding people before you leave. The next person would like to come forward. Hi there, my name's Julia Chappelle and I'm a resident of Belleville, taxpayer in Belleville. I've been here uh, since I was 15, which you know, 12 years ago. Um, um, I want to thank the camp committee. I don't think this is likely the same committee that was working on this uh, amendment back in 2021 because we had a new we had an election, so probably new members. Um, Dylan Consulting, maybe we're consistent. Maybe they were working on it in 2021, so maybe our outside consulting firm brought the consistency. That worries me a little bit because I know we've done surveys and things, and I just worry about uh, consistency. But what I'm, uh, I own a trailer. My husband retired in 2021, and uh, we decided before then, before we retired, we're going to get a trailer. We're seniors. We can afford a trailer more than we can afford going everywhere, so we've got one. Followed the bylaws, we're allowed to park it in our driveway. We do in the summer, uh, we keep, uh, as another person said. It's a nice, neat trailer. It's not derelict. Our house isn't derelict. It doesn't affect anyone. I've never had anyone come to us and complain about it. I've had people walk by, say, nice trailer, and ask about it, but I've never had a complaint. Um, what I heard it was Rory say that things are dynamic. It's true. Like in 2021, when you first talked about this, we are in the midst of the pandemic. Things were the way they were, and I think everyone would agree things are different. Costs are different. The cost of travel, the cost of food, groceries, everything's changed. And it's an inexpensive, a more expensive way to travel than others. And um, I don't understand how it's causing a problem or how it's making Belleville better by trailers and driveways. I don't understand that at all. Not a question because I understand my husband explained. It's just to give comments to. Um, I see a lot of things in Belleville that I feel are affecting Belleville. And uh, I'm not getting into that, but I just want to explain the time and money spent in doing this to get trailers and other things in the, in the bylaw being done compared to things that aren't being done. So if someone comes to Belleville as a tourist, a visitor, when you're bringing in businesses to get them to come here and pay more taxes, we can't bring them near our downtown. We need more housing. We've got the homeless. That's an eyesore. We need help for those people. In my mind, trailers aren't an eyesore. Our time and money could be spent on something different. Um, and... Uh, I just want to thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Dunst. I've been a resident of Elville for almost 40 years now. Um, so we have a 24 foot travel trailer. And the main purpose of us having this trailer is we have two young children and we want them doing activities that doesn't involve a screen all the time. So we purchased this trailer a couple years ago and we keep it in our driveway all summer long in between trips as other folks have said. Now with this new bylaw, we wouldn't be able to do that. We'd have to keep it in storage and I don't know if we can afford the extra $120 a month to store the trailer. So if that's the case, then we might not be able to keep our trailer. We'll have to sell it and then our children will, you know, be stuck staring at screens or doing stuff in town, not getting out into nature not doing the things that we would want them to be doing. Now, I think we could probably amend the bylaw though so that it's um, not restricted to sizes. I understand we don't want things right up against sidewalks, tripping hazards, maybe possible accidents, but we have a 50 foot long driveway with a 24 foot trailer. It's not in the way, it's not an eyesore. I don't see why we wouldn't be able to store our trailer there. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ron Harris. Lived here for 49 years. Um, I have a number of points, no particular order here, partly in reaction to a lot of things people have said. And I'll just hit on those as supportive of them. Uh, but before I start, I'd first like to, to thank uh, the city and Tom. Uh, I was at one of the open houses. We had a good conversation. Uh, he asked me to put some of the points I made. 
uh, into an email, which I did and sent to him. And uh, surprisingly, last week I got a phone call from him saying, I'd just like to follow up with your, uh, your comments and some things that we've talked about. I found that very, very positive. And again, would like to uh, thank Tom and his colleague who was also at the, uh, the open house. Um, but given this opportunity for a public input to directly to you, uh, to the councillors, points here. Um, first of all, I'd also like to put it in the context of Belleville. What we have here, a city on the water, is a, a fairly unique thing for communities this size in Ontario. And so I think the city should be doing everything it can to help make this something for the residents to easily enjoy and take advantage of. So keep that in mind. Um, the other question I have, and I know this isn't an, an interchange, but I'll leave it as a question with you. 2012, a similar proposal was made and was defeated. What has changed since 2012? A lot of things in our world have changed, but what has changed in terms of size of homes, being able to store recreational vehicles or commercial vehicles? Again, I'll leave that question for you to discuss, uh, but at some point I'd like to know what the answer is. Um, the other point someone made earlier, coming up with something that all can benefit. I recognize um, a lot of these things come up because they're complaint driven. I was in a position uh, at a thousand people under me and a lot of times people would come to me and say, oh, we need a rule, we need to change this because of that. You can make all kinds of rules and tomorrow you need to add one more and the day after another one if it's only complaint driven. So somewhere there needs to be, I think there's solutions that will, we can't please all the people all the time. We all know that expression, but I think there's some solutions that can be made that will enable the people of Belleville who have vehicles that are being addressed in this proposal to, to work with the kinds of concerns that are being presented. And at the same time, some of those people who are complaining uh, about size of things in people's driveways, given the size that that can be addressed to. Um, my understanding, and again, I may not be fully informed, but I think with the newer subdivisions, you have much smaller property sizes. And that presents then some problems in terms of how big of a of recreational vehicle one should be able to store, as opposed to the gentleman who said he's got a 50 foot driveway. So what's the problem with putting a 25 foot boat in that? A 25 foot boat in Potter's Creek, yeah, would consume the whole driveway problem. So different strokes for different folks, okay? I think there's provisions that can be made that will allow those people who have a property that's an appropriate size for the size of recreational vehicle they have with certain provisions. One being that the simple one it must be, I think it's within one meter of a sidewalk. Those kinds of things would allow those who can have something of a certain size and are able to store it on their property, but also deal with those people who maybe live in a smaller um, lot that it would be problematic. So certain provisions would allow those people who are able to do it without interfering with other people to do it, and those that can't do it, well, sorry, <laughs> you bought a house that's this size, and unfortunately, you know, you can't do it. Um, get my list back up here. The, the other thing um, that has been expressed a number of times and much more eloquently than I can do it, but the preparation for trips. You know, having all that, I think 
lady back here said it. Anyway, yeah, you just don't say, okay, we're going on a three week trip tomorrow. We'll go pick up the RV and off we go. You got to put the food in. You got to get the refrigerator cold. You've got to get everything, the bedding, all that stuff in. It takes time. By the proposal here, as she said, you would not be able to. You would be violating a bylaw by bringing it the day before, spending the day, loading it up, and leaving the next morning and parking it overnight. And the same thing when you return. That, that just seems senseless to have that kind of thing or that, that kind of proposal. And to have somebody say, I know I'm, I'm, I'm violating a bylaw, but what am I going to do? Okay. Um, length has been a constant uh, 